My dog walked right past it, just feet away. My son walked past it. My wife walked past it. My daughter walked past it. I was born in Pasco, Washington in 1970. Joined the military in 1988 and uh, became a combat medic and uh, been in the medical field all my life till I retired medically and uh, moved to this little tiny corner in Washington State, Northeast Washington, uh, 90 miles above Spokane, um, to start my family. Been here ever since. And uh, couldn't have picked a better place on this earth, in my opinion. So how did you become interested then in the, the whole uh, Sasquatch Bigfoot phenomenon then? Well, <clears throat> We had an, I had an encounter, face-to-face -face encounter in 2013 uh, that started this all. And before this encounter, I was always a skeptic or a believer. I was on the fence. Lifelong outdoorsman, you name it, I've probably done it. And... Uh, just never crossed my mind that what happened in 2013 would occur. And uh, on that particular day, it just, it changed my life 180 degrees and it became an obsession not to go out and be the world's famous or the, 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 the expert in everything but no to go out and take a scientific approach from a medical and a military point of view and uh, do my own research and i've been really lucky and uh ooh, it's a long story but uh Dude, it's been well, 10 years yeah let's just get into that yeah. first encounter just you know tell me in detail what happened okay um My family and I travel all around this area and we explore all over the place. Uh, and there's this one particular trail on the Colville National Forest that we love to walk. And uh, it's a short walk, it's 1.7 miles, but it's a steep walk. It isn't for the novice or uh, out of shape people. It's a, it's a pretty good hike. And uh, it ends up at the top of this ridge line where there's this flat ledge where you can overlook this beautiful canyon. And we love to get up there, sit up there at this spot, enjoy the view for as long as we want, and then work our way back down and head home. And this one particular day in August, 2013, we were bored, pretty warm out. It was 90 plus degrees. And uh, one of my kids decided, hey, let's, let's go take a walk up Hoodoo Canyon Trail. I don't mind divulging this, this information at all. Um, it's a national forest, explore, uh, hike all you want. That's what it's there for, to enjoy. And uh, so I'm like, let's go, let's, let's go. And uh, we get there and uh, start our hike, start our walk. And uh, it's a, it's a trail. It's not a, a road. So it, we, we go up at single file. And the first leg drops down across this Creek called dead man Creek cross a cool little bridge, and then you start zigzagging your way up, slowly working your way up. And uh, my son at the time was 15. My daughter was 13. My wife, myself, and our dog. And my son is 
full of energy. So he's he's just bound in the head, just leapfrog in the head, in the lead. And we know this trail. We know where all the little stops are to rest. We know where everybody is going to stop and um, cool down in the shade or uh, et cetera. I'm extremely hard of hearing, very hard of hearing. Um, thank you, Uncle Sam. Appreciate it. <laughs> so my son, he's working his way up and he gets to this first spot where we kind of take a, our first break and he's standing there and he's looking across this little canyon, this little draw. And he says to me, dad, there's something large over there in those trees that's making a lot of loud crashing, snapping, crunching, uh, abnormal noise. And, uh, I thought first, just a moose, maybe some of this free range cattle that are in the area that are moseying around and didn't pay no attention to it. So he jumps up ahead. Here we come up single file, line, you know, heading up. And he's, he stopped again, uh, 10, 15 minutes later. And he, he points again. He says, dad, the noise is straight across from us again. And uh, my wife and my daughter come up and they hear it. And I'm trying to hear this commotion and I don't hear it, uh, but they all do. And uh, so as we're going up, these sounds are horizontal to us, but drop down onto and into another canyon on another side. So we're working our way up. And I couldn't count how many times he or my daughter or my wife had stopped us to point out this noise. Uh, I still never heard it uh, just because of my hearing is so bad. But they're all pointing out. It's, it's way over there. It's over there. And again, I'm thinking it's got to be a moose. It's got to be a free range cattle that's spread out. Um, but it was very odd that these sounds were parallel, horizontal to us, and uh, almost even with us, working our way up. And it continued, and it continued. And we just paid it no attention. It was just something that we were just pointing out and uh, ignoring. Didn't think nothing of it. Well, there's this last stretch of this trail that uh, is flat and ends up at this lookout, this flat ledge that overlooks this canyon where we're heading to. My son had just, he just took off. He wanted to beat everybody there. And uh, so I let him go. No big deal. And uh, we get there. And he wasn't there. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. Now, the first thought in my mind, I just had this gut sinking feeling that he fell off the edge, goofing off, uh, not paying attention. Um, and it's a it's it's straight rock wall, vertical, 120 feet straight down. And uh, I'm peeking over the edge, and I'm looking for him, and and uh, I'm yelling for him. Now, directly behind this flat ledge where it drops down, there's another ledge to our back that goes up, kind of like a, it's just a bench. And uh, as I'm yelling for him and my wife's yelling for him and my daughter's, you know, screaming, um, he peeks out over the, he peeks out over the edge looking down upon us. And I look up at him and I'm like, get your butt down right now. Get down here. And uh, he shimmies his way down, maybe 30 feet down. Um, and I'm asking him, I'm grilling him. 
what are you doing up there? And uh, he goes, Dad, when I got here, there was a man peering over, looking down at me. Now, I didn't believe him because where we were parked at, we were the only rig at the trailhead. Uh, nobody else was up here. And uh, I thought it was very odd that somebody would be peeking over, staring down uh, upon us. But again, I, I still didn't believe him. Uh, just, just the chances of somebody being there was uh, astronomical. I just didn't believe him. So well, we sat there for about 30 minutes and enjoyed our respite, the view. And uh, the whole trek up this trail, the huckleberries were prime. They were like the size of grapes. And we were just picking our way, working our way up, eating. Uh, fingers were purple. Lips were purple. Tongue. We, we had eaten plenty on our way up. And uh, we decide it's time to head back. We've got about an hour before the sun drops behind the, the mountain range and it starts to get dark. And we didn't want to be back at the vehicle at dark. We want to be right, right on time, uh, right at dusk. And so we turn around and we start heading back down the trail, single file. And my dog, he's in front. He's always in front. He's always got to be the lead. Um, German Shepherd lab mix, about a hundred pounds, uh, pretty good sized dog. And, uh, he's been everywhere with us. He, he's been every hike, every outing we've ever gone on. So he's part of the group. Then it was my son and my wife. So those three were single file heading back down. Then it was my daughter and I'm following up in the rear. And on this particular stretch of the trail, it makes this perfect 90 degree right hand turn. And then it makes another 90 degree left hand turn. And once you make that left hand turn, you're out of sight. So my daughter and I are following up. My dog, my wife, and my son, they had made the two turns and they were out of sight. And I knew where they were going to go sit underneath these cedar trees where it's real cool and wait for us to catch up. And the moment that they disappeared out of my sight, I stopped. I froze in the middle of the trail. I just instantly froze. I felt eyes peering down that predatory feeling of being watched. Um, uneasy, kind of that spooky. Um, your 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 senses pick up this uh, predatory feeling, and uh, I look to my left on this trail. Thirty feet from myself. with its back leaning up against the tree with the boughs of the pine tree just above its head and its waist 
was, and its knees and its legs were covered in the huckleberry bush. So all we could see, all I could see was from the abdominal muscles to the top of its head. And it's sitting, it's just pressing its back against this tree. Was this little juvenile Sasquatch. I looked at my daughter. She was picking at a couple huckleberries. And I said to her, not loud, but I go, Haley. I whistled to her and I said, look right there. She turns around. Now she's facing me now. So we're, we're facing each other. And I go, look right there. And I'm adamant for her to look. And she kind of gets a little attitude. She's like, dad, I don't want any more huckleberries. I, I'm done. I, she thought I was pointing out a big, fresh group of huckleberries for us to munch on. And as soon as she looked over and she saw what I'm pointing out, she's 13. And she goes, holy effing S. That's a Sasquatch. I go, shh, I know. Shh, look, look. We back up two or three feet to get a little closer to it. And it's sitting with its back up against this tree, thinking it's sneaky, thinking it's, you know, it's uh, camouflaged very well, but it knows it's spotted. So it's, it's not running. It didn't get up and run away. But it sat there. And it would reach out, make eye contact with us. It would grab a huckleberry, purse its lips, and just eat one and, and watch us. And it would continue this, picking a huckleberry, and it would look back and forth. And we're going, it, my daughter and I are looking back and forth. It's watching us. This little guy had the look of happiness, curiosity. It had this little smirk on its face, like it was, it thought it was sneaky, or just this little curled up smirk in the corner of its lip. But it sat there as long as we didn't do anything aggressive. Eating these huckleberries like it's watching a movie. Just one at a time. S slowly picking at them. Now the whole time I'm sitting here taking these visual snapshots in my mind, just trying to remember every single little detail possible. And I had a handgun on me, but I had it, my t-shirt had it, it was, had it covered. Um, no way in my mind did I ever think about utilizing it for any reason ever at all, unless something, uh, you know, last resort. But in my mind, this was a moment of just pure bliss. For all three of us, I don't think it expected us to notice it. My dog walked right past it, just feet away. My son walked past it. My wife walked past it. My daughter walked past it. In fact, you could almost reach out with your left arm and have touched it as each one of us passed it. And it would have been on our left side as we're working our way down. And 
we would have been on its right side, but it was just packed in so tight in this brush with its back against this tree with the boughs that it was just sneaky. He was a sneaky little guy, but he had no care in the world to get up and run. He showed no fear. He was happy. He didn't, I never saw his teeth, but I don't think he had a care in the world that he had had been exposed. Now we're sitting here. And I'm counting the minutes. I'm looking at my watch. We are past the five minute mark of this visual encounter. And to back up, what a dumb mistake did I make? We didn't bring any our phones. We didn't even bring any water with this because we're used to this getting up to this trail and working our way back down. We were just out for just a quick walk. Um, oh, if I had a, if I had my phone or some sort of recording device, it probably not would have happened. But what a mistake that was. So we're sitting here having this three-way stare down and it wasn't moving other than eating these huckleberries real slow and content. Now I, I could hear my wife and my son starting to come back because they're wondering what's taking us so long. And I knew, I knew once they came back up the trail and made this last corner, um, my dog was probably going to see it. And I was going to tell my wife to slow down, be quiet and grab the dog and keep a hold of him. Cause I didn't want him going after. And then I, who knows what would have happened, but I told my daughter, go, 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 go catch, let's catch up. Let's catch up. And Just as we started to leave, we had only made a couple steps away from the sky. I turned to get one last glimpse over my left shoulder. And he stood up. And I say he because it was a male. It had male genitalia. It had a penis, had a scrotum, and he took just one step as I'm looking to the left to get this last glimpse, and then he was into the stark timber and gone. So my wife and my son and my daughter and I, we meet up, and my wife's like, what are you guys doing? What's taking you guys so long? And <laughs> I, I, I'm just like, you have no idea. You have no idea what we just saw and encountered. And I says, come here, come here. I want to show you something. And we kind of get back to the same area. And I'm pointing out where all this is, all this had just occurred. And, uh, of course my wife and my son believe us. And now I believe my son from what he said he saw, because what I think was, the whole time we were working our way up this trail, we were being side healed by one or multiple in this area. And I think what my saw what my son saw was either this little guy or another one peeking over observing us. Now, I felt, I felt that there was more around due to the fact that this little guy and the, what my son had saw and just this uneasy feeling in this area, working our way back down. 
Um, the sun is just starting to set, starting to get a little dark. And it's that prime time for coyotes to start their roll call. The coyotes to start howling, going off. I mean, they are just howling like crazy. And from the general direction that this juvenile male Sasquatch had kind of walked, but way further away into an, another canyon or longer or further draw was this return scream, just a scream to these coyotes. And that scream instantly shut those coyotes up. They made not a sound afterwards, and the whole forest was just dead quiet. We're working our way back down the truck. And we're talking about this the whole way down, stopping and discussing it. We're, we're, we, we still can't believe my daughter and I are. We still can't believe what we saw, but we know it was real. Um, we get home. And the only thing on my mind from that point on was. I'm going back tomorrow and I start to pack our camper up. I'm loading up with everything I could think of to go back and camp. And we did the next day, 24 hours later. And what a night we had that night. So I'd like to pause from at that point, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, we get home. I'm packing up our camper. Next day, I want to leave as early as possible. And my kids want to bring one of their best friends with us. And uh, I'm like, sure, more the merrier. Let's go. Um, so we get up there early morning and uh, make a long story short. We set up camp and do the normal camp set up things, chairs, tables, you know, get everything organized. Uh, but the only thing on my mind is I want to get back up to that exact spot. And, I, and I'm, I'm bringing gear with me. Uh, cameras, GoPro, uh, you name it. I'm, I'm hauling gear up with me uh, just in case we have another possible encounter. We didn't, um, but I was prepared. Um, but the whole time we're setting up camp, I'm just, I'm just antsy. I want to get up there and uh, I want to go by myself because I want to get up there as fast as possible. Um, but they all wanted to go again, especially uh, my kid's friend. He wants to go. He wants to see what we saw. He was all excited, but he was like, yeah, whatever guys. Um, so we all get up there. Um, they go to the lookout and I stop at the area where this guy was sitting. And uh, I look on the ground. And there is this perfect specimen of fecal matter that you could tell was... extremely fresh now if this had been a person i would assume there would have been toilet paper um possibly but i knew nobody else had been up there because we had gotten back to the truck at dark and we were back up there i think by 10 o'clock the next morning and there's one spot on the trail where it's very sandy 
and dirty and there was no new footprints no nobody had been up since we had come back down so the first thing i did was i start laying out uh, a medical kit and uh I collected this sample using the best possible sterile technique I could muster with the equipment that I had at the time. I had two sterile vials, and then I had a small sandwich bag, but I had a pair of uh, surgical gloves, sterile surgical gloves, and sterile um, medical instruments that I always carry with me um, in my backpack. First thing I did was I took a piece of uh, stick, a pine tree stick off the ground, and I probed the fecal matter. And there was just enough pressure on the outer layer, just enough resistance that uh, I could tell it was extremely fresh, but not within hours. And then it would puncture into the soft material. So I knew that this was, uh, it had to have been from this guy, this, this male Sasquatch leaving this, uh, bowel movement right where it had been squatting and or sitting. So I collect this and, uh, bring it home. And, from that day on, that's another story with the sample. Um, but from that day on, uh, I've just been absolutely obsessed with finding physical evidence, um, et cetera. Now, <clears throat> we get back down to camp, and it's mid-afternoon. And it's hot out. Uh, the kids go down and they're playing in the creek. Uh, wife, she's doing her little piddling around. I'm doing my piddling around, cutting up firewood, uh, getting stuff ready for night. And uh, just having a good old time. Um, Going to enjoy our couple days camping in this spot. And we're chattering back and forth every once in a while about how cool of an experience uh, my daughter and I just had 24 hours prior. But uh, not overly obsessed with talking about it. It was just here or there. Well, <clears throat> nighttime comes. Sun sets. I believe it was a full moon or very close to a full moon. Not a cloud in the sky. You could see every star, every constellation. It was just one of those gorgeous, warm summer evenings that you, you just enjoy to kick back and, and uh, decompress your stress. Get the fire going. Kids are cooking s'mores, marshmallows, hot dogs, whatever. Um, and we're all just sitting around a campfire. Just talking, having fun, enjoying each other's company. And uh, my dog, this is very important. Uh, I point this out. Um, I mentioned that my dog was uh, unaware of this male juvenile Sasquatch when he passed by. Again, just a short distance from it. He didn't smell it. He didn't alert on it. He didn't sense it. Um, but as we're sitting around a campfire, he has his own little camp chair. And he'll get up in this camp chair 
and work his way into this little camp chair, into this little kind of position he loves. And he'll just sit and he'll just stare into the coals, wherever dogs go when they dream, like when we stare into the coals at a, around the fire. And he's kind of just drifting off. And uh, all of a sudden, he alerted to something. So before I get to what happened, we're on this, we're, we're camped on this flat ledge, uh, this field. And the trailhead is about 30 yards from our campfire and the trail just dumps down into this canyon. And on our right, it's about a hundred yards and there's another canyon or draw. And then to our left, it's the same. So we're on this flat plateau and on three sides of us, it drops down into this, these three canyons. So he alerts to something. And before I could even think about what he's up to, he's out of that chair and he has his butt running towards the trailhead. And he stops right at the darkness where he's where it drops down. And he is laser focused on something down in that dark area. He is just, he is just, he is just, dad, in my mind, he's thinking, dad, I, I got whatever's down here. I got you guys protected. And I'm looking at my dog like, I've never seen him do this before in my life. I've never seen him growl, bark, mean, uh, just this big old goofy teddy bear who's just a joy to be around. But to see him react in this manner, I knew immediately there was danger down there. He knew something was down there that he didn't like. What I couldn't figure out was over the years of pounding these mountains with this dog, him and I have run across every creature in the woods. Grizzly bear, cougar, moose, elk, deer, lynx, bobcat, uh, cocktail rabbits, grouse, you name it. Um, so he's, I mean, we've had cougar run right in front of us, crossing a trail in front of us. And he just looks at like, oh, that's a cute kitty cat. Um, he's chased after bears. Like, goofing around um so this was completely out of the norm for him kind of scary because i i thought i knew this dog inside and out and uh i go up to him and i grab him by his collar and i start to pull him back uh, not hurting him not not aggressive but i'm i'm pulling on him like come on and he puts all of his power no, he is, he is fighting. He is fighting me. And I start pulling a little harder and he's fighting me a little harder. And I, I can't figure out what he's freaking out on, what he's being so obsessively focused, laser focused. The only thing on my mind was there has to be a cougar right down there that he thinks is going to come up and mess with us. But again, that's the only thing I could think of. Um, there's grizzly bears in this area. There's wolves, um, lots of wolves. Um, again, he's been around all these woodland animals. And, uh, I, I I just thought it's got to be a cougar. So I'm pulling a little harder and a little harder. 
and he's fighting me and fighting me. And finally he gives in. And uh, he kind of mopes his way back to the campfire. But he's still kind of looking back. And instead of getting back up in the camp chair, he lays on the ground staring at the same spot, but he's right by the campfire. Um, but he, he's laser focused again on this area. And uh, we're talking about how odd this behavior is. And I says, don't worry. Um, if it's a cougar that comes up, uh, I'll do whatever it takes, you know, um, not saying I would kill it, but do whatever it takes to protect life and limb and, uh, or whatever came up. Well, nothing came up, nothing came up out the darkness and, uh, it, it got quiet for a few minutes. We're all kind we all got quiet for a few minutes. And then all hell broke loose. It just sounded like somebody was down where my dog was laser focused, completely trying to destroy everything within its reach. You're, we're talking about crashing, smashing, busting branches, uh, slamming, just every noise you could think that could be made with whatever would be in reach of the Force 4. And then to our right, it started up. the same loud commotion. And then to our left, in front of us again, and this is going back and forth and back and forth. And the only thing I could think of was that my dog had sensed Whatever was down there was creeping up on us. Slowly. He sensed this prior to this happening. And this commotion continued and continued. Just uh, all three sides of us. Um. Uh, what I then thought was the day prior, what my daughter and I had witnessed and my son was, I think we had walked into their food source, their daycare, their, their kitchen. I believe we walked into a group of Sasquatch that were gorging on this large area of prime ripe huckleberries. I think we disturbed them. I think we upset the natural order in this little small area. My hypothesis is, is that what my daughter and I had witnessed was one of, or possibly the only youth that was up there, and it possibly slipped up and got too close to us, and maybe it got in trouble, and the parents or whatever were upset at us for coming back. And they were letting us know. They, they were just... It, it just was, it was extremely unnerving. Now, <clears throat> I had a generation two night vision monocular that I brought with me. And uh, you could see about 200 yards easily um, from the natural 
moonlight. And then there was an infrared illuminator that you could push. And then you could see an extra about 200 yards. So as soon as I would hear this, this noise in front of us, I was right there, ran up there, looked, 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 couldn't see anything. Very odd. And uh, then off to the right. And I would run over there as fast as I could to get to that spot and look down in there. And we kept doing this. Finally, I gave it to my son. I said, you stand right here. You just keep looking. You just keep looking. And uh, he never saw anything. But this commotion, this, I just call it a, a fit they were throwing. Um, and they, I mean, three. That uh, it unnerved my children's friend enough that he wanted to go inside the camper. So he went inside the camper and my daughter went inside the camper and they were in there doing whatever at the time they were doing um, Pokemon cards or playing, I don't know, playing whatever card games or whatever. And uh, this commotion kept going on and on and on. There would be slow, dull periods, half an hour, an hour. It would pick back up. Uh, my wife went inside the camper finally and to go read. And uh, I stayed at my spot at the campfire. And I'm a stander. I like to stand. I don't like to sit. I like to stand and um, just in case, got to be ready for whatever happens. Um, and my son... He's sitting in the cat chair and he's standing in the coals. And again, this commotion is still going on. We're just, we're just kind of trying to ignore it, hoping it'll calm down. Um, but he's standing in the coals. And he stands up very slowly, almost. Now, this is, this is my memory. This is how I remember it, crystal clear. He stands up real slow out of his camp chair. He turns around, and he steps off into the darkness, just just past the illumination of the fire where I couldn't see him. I'm thinking he's going to go take a week or just stretch his legs for a minute or two, or he was getting tired and he wanted to just kind of get his blood flowing. And I look at my watch and it's been over a minute And I'm thinking he's been gone for quite some time if he's just urinating. And uh, I give it a few more seconds. And to our right, it's about 100 yards to this little canyon, this draw, where this one of the three was making all this noise. And my son yells extremely loud, dad, as loud as he could. And I just fly as fast as I can to get to him. And he's got his back to me. We're in pitch black darkness, except for the moonlight and the starlight. And uh, you could see, I could see his silhouette against the pitch black dark timber where it drops down. And he's 
got his back to me. I grab him by his shoulder to try to turn him around. And as he starts to quarter and turn around, he's still looking down. And I look down. And we both momentarily saw this extremely large, your typical large silhouette of a, again, I'm just using this word, Sasquatch. You could not see any facial features. You could not make out any thing other than the silhouette from the moonlight. The only thing that him and I both saw, including the silhouette, was this very soft amber glow of eyes. Just this, not bright, not eye shine, but just this super soft amber glow of a set of eyes and it turned around and this is just bang 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 it turned around and it ran into the pitch black darkness boom cr crashing and gone of course it, it was down into the blackness I cannot explain for the life of me what made my son get up, act like a robot, this almost void of normal reaction, just turned around and walked straight to what we saw. I cannot explain it. Um, many people have said that it's infrasound. They can talk to you telepathically. Um, I don't know, but I know what I know what occurred was extremely scary. Is it as if he was being controlled by this being? And I believe 100%, and I'll go to my grave with this, that if he hadn't called out for me, I believe he would have been taken. I believe he would have disappeared. One of those 411 mysteries. Because I can't explain what drew him to this being if that's what it was a being I, I i i i don't know i do know what my daughter and i saw the day before was flesh and blood living breathing but this this one i don't know uh sabella irwin has a drawing um, that she allowed me to use on a previous podcast that illustrates exactly what we saw uh, minus uh, the facial features. Um, I didn't um, know if I was supposed to send you any photographs or anything, but um, this ruckus still continued. It slowed down. Uh, my son went to bed. He went to camper. I stayed up all night long. I stayed up till sunrise. Um, finally, right at the crack of dawn, right at the crack of dawn, they stopped. There was no more. Um, I do remember uh, the next morning, my daughter saying that she peeked out the blinds of the camper, which would have been to our left, and she saw in the distance of uh, a black figure um, and she closed the blinds and didn't say anything. 
Um, I have no reason to doubt her because that's where one of the three was, was at. Um, he might've, it might've been coming closer to our camper. Um, and she just happened to catch a glimpse, but we packed up that morning and we moved seven miles up the mountain to get away from them, from, to get away from the spot, to leave them alone. And, uh, that was it. No more. We got out of their area. And, uh, I think we spent the next three days. Nothing happened, but I, I believe we stumbled into their, their spot and they were extremely upset that we were there at that point in time. And that's how it all began. Wow. That first is week, first, <laughs> an amazing story. Uh, that's just the beginning. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, that's the beginning of my uh, obsession with what I've been doing the past 10 years. And a lot has happened since then. And, uh, well, tell me some we, more. Tell me what all has happened since then that's significant. You name a subject, I probably have some great information on it. Um, there's just two. I mean, I'm not saying every time I go out there, I find something. Absolutely not. Uh, I put in the time. Um, there's... There was a point in time where I was away from home more than I was at home. I was out in the woods, sleeping in the woods more than I was at home. Um, I've said this previous, uh, that uh, without the support of my wife and my family, uh, I wouldn't have been able to have done what I have done, found and collected, uh, witnessed. Most of what has occurred, I have had witnesses, at least one with me. Um, to verify uh, these findings. Um, well, I want to hear. I don't about, know where, yeah, I don't know where to begin. That, yeah. Well, well what, <laughs> I, what, is, what is some of the evidence? What uh, you said you got some samples. Um, okay. Back away. So, you know, tell me about that. Sure. It's kind of a sad story. It's what I didn't expect, but it's become part of my uh, learning experience. So, again, when I collected this sample, being in the medical field, I know, I know how to collect certain. I know how to do it without contamination as best as possible in the environment that you're given. So when I collected this fecal sample, I get home. Um, after we come back camping, I had, I had put it in the freezer at home, not our freezer in our kitchen, um, but our secondary freezer in our basement. And uh, I took it out and uh, I started to examine it. And not to start going off topic here, but if you're a skilled outdoorsman, you can identify the fecal matter of just about every animal in the woods, especially ungulates, uh, cats. Of course, they're going to cover their stool. Um, bear, that's easy. Um, coyote, wolf, um, more than likely are going to have crushed bone. A lot of hair in it. Um, you can tell it has a lot of meat in it. Um, this this stool sample had all the visual signs of a human digestive tract. And without going on a long uh, educational tour, of our digestive system. 
as our food works its way down from our stomach to our small intestines into our large intestine, it starts to build up this particular looking pattern. Um, I forgot what candy bar people reference it to, or I referenced, referenced it to, but it has a, almost a segmented, um, look, um, not loose stool, um, but the average human stool has a very particular look by the way it travels through our digestive system. So I knew that this was, uh, I had something I knew. Um, I would dissect it open. Um, I could tell that most of it was meat, was not uh, vegetable, not vegetation. There wasn't really any seeds in it, but it was mostly meat. It had that meat consumption look. Intertwined in the material were deer hair. So I wrote down in my journal, deer, question mark, uh, me, pertaining to the feces. Now, you can identify deer hair by under a microscope by the way it looks. It's hollow. It has a very particular look. So I started to pull off hairs one at a time from the outer shell of the outside, the outer edges of the sample. And one by one, I'm looking at them and I'm discarding them. That's deer. That's deer. That's deer. That's deer. And I found one that was clear. It had no medulla in the center. It was clear. And I thought, aha, this had to have sloughed off or gotten caught coming off its rear end, stuck to it as it had its bowel movement. So I took that hair and I put it in a sealed envelope and I just wrote question mark on it. And uh, I started a Facebook page a couple of days prior called North East Washington Sasquatch Society. And I started to keep posts up about this encounter and all the feedback I got, the people contacting me with their stories just come flooding in uh, from this local area. And uh, I want to say a couple weeks later, and to this day, I still don't know how, but I get a call from Dr. Jeff Meldrum. And I'm just like, for real? And he's like, yes, this is Jeff. Um, so we start talking. He goes, tell me about your samples. And uh, I go into detail. He goes, I want you to send those to me right away. Get them to me. So he gives me the information and how to get them straight to him. And uh, he contacts me a couple weeks later. And all he says to me, do you want to participate in a documentary about this finding and what you and your daughter had witnessed? Now, we're only talking a couple months since this is this happened and i'm baffled at this offer um but of course i i still was not in shock and awe but i'm like this guy's calling me offering me there must be something that he's found seen or knows that wants this 
documented, excuse me, put into a documentary. So I consent and uh, he sets it all up somehow. And uh, a film crew flies from Toronto, Canada to Las Vegas, Nevada. Then they drive from Las Vegas, Nevada, all the way up to my little corner of Washington State. Four professional uh, people in the film crew. We're not talking about rinky dinky little cameras. We're talking about these guys were, they had the mic booms, they had all the gear. They were, this, this is a professional crew. And uh, they want to go to this exact spot. And uh, we take them up there. And uh, they weren't prepared for the hike. I think they thought it was just going to be some little walk in the park. But they made it. We made it back down. And we spent the whole day filming this. And uh, good old time. When we get back to uh, our rigs, the producer uh, goes and talks to his assistant and she comes over and she hands us a form to, to sign and um, being a dummy, I just thought it was just a, you know, just a standardized form saying whatever. I really didn't read it. Um, mistakes happen. And uh, they pack up and they leave. Now, time goes on and uh, I'm, ex I'm expecting at some point in time to have this show presented to me to say that's good or give my feedback. Um, I was hoping. Well, that never happened. Um, somebody contacted me on my page and says, Hey, have you watched your documentary? And I'm like, no, he goes, well, you need to watch it. And I'm like, well, where's it at? And he sends me the link. And in the, uh, documentary, it's my daughter and myself. And then they also filmed, uh, a retired police officer in Northern Idaho, his encounter. So it was my daughter and I, and this, uh, other gentlemen intertwined um, in this documentary. Uh, Dr. Meldrum is filmed opening up my envelopes, um, examining the hairs, and uh, it's clearly it's clearly stated that they it's unknown. They don't know what it is. Uh, not in their database. It's it's unidentifiable to them. Um, that's what I believe he had already prior examined it and wanted. You know, it was like a recreation for him doing this, uh, looking at my hairs. Uh, they'd already been looked at. Um, so the documentary goes on and it cuts to some British people. Little did I know, uh, speaking, little did I know it was a company called, uh, I won't name the, name the company, uh, out of uh, Britain. And uh, they were just making, they were making mean comments. Um, what my daughter and I saw was a uh, an escaped walking circus bear. Um, just it, those little snarky comments those skeptics make um, all throughout the documentary. Um, it was just condescending. And uh, towards the end, uh, Dr. Meldrum says uh, or states that he's going to send these hairs to NYU for further analysis. Um, a doctor at NYU uh, had examined these hairs and uh, at the end of the documentary 
kind of insulting. He just comes out and says, they're both white tailed deer. And kind of this, this was a waste of my time. And that's kind of how the documentary ended. It made, it made me and my daughter's encounter look like fools. It, it was disrespectful. Um, so why would Dr. Meldrum go through all this effort, send this film crew, get all this set up, have all this done if there wasn't something there initially? No. Well, End of the let's, series. Let's, let's examine this a minute. On Okay, so you sent all of the samples to him. You, you kept nothing, right? I kept, I, I still have. Well, uh, on the hairs um, that you sent, do you believe that you sent one that was not a deer hair? Is that right? 100% 100% correct. That it wasn't a and, deer hair. So you know they oh, had a hair, to your knowledge, was not a deer hair, but they said it was a deer hair. Is that right? At the end, correct. Okay. So it, it basically just discredited everything that you knew you had or thought you had anyway. Exactly. It was embarrassing. Now, yes. that's why for 10 years, I have not spoken about this. I've continued my field research and continued, but kept zip, just zip tight. Um, I'm not going to get burned again. And, uh, but now I feel, I feel refreshed and, uh, I'm wanting to share all this information that I have gathered, uh, things I have witnessed with people, uh, et cetera. Now that, uh, I feel needs to come out, uh, because the, the field now is so flooded with, there's too many, there's, there's, there's too many out there. And uh, maybe, maybe not enough in certain areas, but it's uh, the internet, YouTube, it's just filled with um, researchers, investigators, et cetera. Um, well, there's also a, a lot of, a lot of the shows, like you said, um, that, you know, we don't contrive things on, on this show, but a lot of mm -hmm. places they do. Now, that's not to say that I confirm everything that people tell me on the show. Um, but I have um, interviewed a lot of people that have had large film crews come in and they just make up stuff. It's not their story at all. It's just a contrived uh, interpretation or just whatever they want to make it to be a sensationalistic mm -hmm. show. We try mm -hmm. not to do that on anything that, you know, that I'm a participant in because I'd rather have a bad show that's not popular uh, than to make up something just to sensationalize it. So I can appreciate Absol your point of view. Yes. That's that's how I feel too. Yes. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, you had on uh, my uh, research partner and uh, him and I have had, him and I have had many, many, many encounters together. Um, and sometimes you get lucky. You, sometimes you're in the right area. And, uh, but it sure takes a lot of work and a lot of time spent doing, the, doing things correctly, uh, having the right vibe. You don't want to be out there with uh, the sense of violence. Or uh, one of the words that I don't like to hear is you're a Sasquatch hunter. Um, that, 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 in my mind, is um, you're out to harm. Um, I'm just a research, a field investigator. I go out and find something, never say 100% this is this, but I, I offer my findings and uh, allow my findings to uh, explain themselves or let people 
give positive and negative feedback. Um, that's one reason I should mention this. I did stop my Sasquatch page on Facebook for a couple of years due to um, what I will say politely is plagiarism, uh, downright uh, taking some of my photographs, my evidence and then altering them and then uh, people using them on their own um, or taking my stories and altering just a few small minor details. You know, your work, you know, when somebody has taken your work and said it's their own. Um, I just got sick of that. And, uh, um, but now, like I said, now I'm refreshed and I'm ready to share everything that I have. Uh, well, tell me, tell me, I, you've got a lot of research history. What else have you found? What else have you discovered? What other encounters have you experienced? Tell me about those. Okay. Um, Can I mention a podcast I was on recently? Sure. Yes. Okay. Um, I did two uh, back-to-back um, podcasts on uh, Untold Radio with Doug and his son, Hi Check, uh, um, Alex. And uh, part two, um, probably the some of the best evidence um, I think anybody's ever found. Um that you would have to watch to uh, to see for your own eyes. Um, but on part one, uh, I'd like to talk about communication, vocals. Okay. Um, yeah. There's so many, so many reports of people hearing speech, vocals, some sort of chatter some sort of whatever. Um, I had an extremely close encounter with vocals with a witness um, that is unlike anything ever reported. And uh, after I explain this um i was urged to talk to uh, ron moorhead and converse with him um because the, uh i was asked to compare his sierra sounds with what myself and my buddy heard and uh polar opposites so i'll do my I'll do my best to explain it. Um, I will not be able to reproduce the vocals, but I will, uh, it'd be impossible, but I'll uh, explain the scenario. <clears throat> so a good buddy of mine, who's an avid outdoorsman, um, but he's, he doesn't do any research. He's not, he doesn't do what I do. Uh, him and I went out one night, just him and I, to get away, spend some time, buddy-buddy time out in the woods. And uh, we drove way up into the forest at the very end of this old logging road. And uh, we parked, and then we walked in uh, on this overgrown logging road. Um, about a mile, maybe a mile and a half. And uh, we just randomly picked a spot to just dump off and go deep into the bush. Let's just, hey, right here, let's just follow, let's just go right into here. And uh, we go into the bush, make our way in, and uh, we get way back up in there into a spot where we think it'd be a cool little spot to uh, set up for the night. Uh, spend some time gathering some rocks to make a little fire ring. And uh, I brought with me a little uh, nylon Walmart little dome tent. Um, mosquitoes were out pretty thick at this point in time. I mean, they were, they were hungry. 
And uh, I didn't want to be sleeping on the ground, eating alive like my buddy Art or my friend. He likes to sleep on the ground um, with no cover, just how he is. So uh, I set up my little dome tent and uh, we go out for a long hike further up the logging road. Now, this is a logging road that's so old, it's overgrown. It's almost like a tunnel in a lot of spots. Um, but it just takes you way up to the top of this mountain called Coyote Mountain. And uh, pitch black night. We're just out enjoying the night. Um, just two good friends having a good time walking, talking, enjoying each other's company. And a uh, little, bit, little bit past midnight, we get back. And uh, the first thing I did was I set up a 360-degree perimeter around our little camp, camp area, um, maybe 50 yards in each direction, just a big circle of fishing line. And in sporadic places on the fishing line, I had brought with us some empty beer cans and attached them to the fishing line. And, each, and in each beer can, I had put in a little pebble. And... Basically, if something were to walk in towards us at night, it would alert, alert us, shake one of the cans, make an audible sound. Um, wasn't worried about uh, anything dangerous. Um, it's just just a habit. Um, while we're sitting there, I pulled out a little cast iron skillet and I start cooking up some bacon ends and pieces um, just to kind of munch on um, no, nothing in mind we I, I had no plan to there was no reason to cook the bacon other than to eat um, I didn't want any scent to get out and attract any animals um, but it just sounded good um, and I think my friend had brought some uh, bratwurst but um, we're sitting there munching away and, uh, as we're done, um, we're just kicking back, talking, getting a little drowsy. Um, he's about 20 yards from me. He's kind of getting his little area on the ground underneath this tree to, uh, where he's going to sleep, kind of the pine needles moved out the way he's making his little. Um, he's getting his bed roll out and I'm standing there and this wolf just flies right between us. And we're, we both witnessed this wolf, um, pretty big wolf. I think what the wolf had smelled was that bacon and he was just flying too fast and came upon us too quick and, uh, didn't have time to stop or react, but it was kind of, you know, one of those once in a lifetime, that was cool. Um, but we just sat there and, uh, got ready for bed and uh, he laid down and I crawl in the tent and uh, both of us fell asleep pretty quick good night sleep one of those really good night sleeps um, he was snoring I was snoring um Then, right at the crack of dawn, when the forest starts to wake, and all the little critters start to move around, the chipmunks start yapping, the birds start communicating. It's day, you know, it's daytime. It's activity starts to pick up. Sun's not up, but it's just that twilight. And uh, just 
behind my tent, just past the fishing line that of this perimeter in this thick, dark cedar grove. We both sat there and we listened to two Sasquatch talking, having a conversation, not yelling, like we're like I'm talking right here, just real calm. One was a female. She had the most softest, and I use this term loosely, but this she had this soft, sexy, estrogen-filled voice. No doubt it was a female. The words, the sounds that came out of her mouth were just, just soft. The other one, now this was a dude. This guy was deep and rough and rumbled, and he had that that raspy, um, that testosterone filled, deep, deep, deep voice. But they're talking back and forth, not stepping over each other's whatever they were sentences, words. She would say something. And he would say something. And this, this continued and continued. And my friend, he's awake. I hear him moving around. And he goes, do you hear that? Now, where the sounds were coming from, he couldn't see anything because his the view my tent was blocking his view so it was a straight line from where he was laying my dome tent and they were directly behind my dome tent behind this fishing line in this dark cedar grove and when he says do you hear that i go shut the shut the f up you know Now, I, this time I brought a camera with me, pretty good camera. But they continued to have this conversation. They knew we were awake. And they continued to have this little conversation, but it just, it picked up its pace just a little bit. Um, not arguing, but they just started chattering, talking just a little bit more. So I slowly grabbed the zipper to the back window of this tent and I just started to unzip it. And when it made that zip sound, they heard that. They got up so fast and they crashed through those trees and through the timber, smashing and just bashing and stomping. I mean, you could feel, you could feel the power of their footsteps pounding on the forest floor as they stomped away. No more vocals. They were done talking. But as, but they, once they got far enough away from us, not another sound, nothing. So all of the people who have reported that I'm aware of, they've always stated it sounds like they're arguing or yelling or um, I've heard it described as samurai, Japanese samurai uh, chatter. Um, no, this was 
this was so calm, respectful, polite conversation that these two had that I can't explain it and I cannot reproduce what we heard. There's no way I could. And I have tried. I've tried so hard to reproduce these sounds. Um, that it's impossible. Um, whatever language or whatever communication they have, um, I don't know. It, maybe how their voice box and their larynx had de has developed. Um, uh, but it was the most fascinating thing next to my daughter and my visual encounter to hear two have any discussion. And what I think they were, they were just sitting there. I think they were just talking about us. Like, look at these two humans. I mean, I wonder if there's any bacon left down there or um, I don't know. Theories are endless, but uh, guarantee you it wasn't no, nobody. There wasn't no humans. Um, because there's only one road in and we would have heard a vehicle come in and where we were at, it would have been next to impossible for somebody to have found us um, and snuck up on us and uh, played a trick like that on us. Um, let alone make the powerful uh, getaway that they did. Um, but that was with a witness. And uh, to this day, it's uh, one of my most vivid memories of uh, communication and uh, I have wanted to contact a military linguist or a government linguist personnel and uh, discuss this with them. But even through that discussion, I would not be able to reproduce or duplicate uh, any sounds that uh, would be of help. And to this day, uh, any recordings that I have heard or people have played me, uh, nothing has even came close to uh, what we heard that early morning. And I spoke with Mr. Moorhead over the telephone and uh, just discussed the differences. There was no similarities. And uh, I don't know, maybe in this area, they have a different dialect than what he recorded in California. Um, you know, just like people from the South have, you know, different dialect and um, people who speak Mandarin or French or uh, any other foreign language. There's so many different languages on this planet. Why couldn't they have different languages, you know, from different areas where they're located. Um, exactly. So have you, that, that's have just you, my theory. Have you been able to gather more um, of the physical evidence at all? I have, I'm very, yes, I'm very, I'm very shy to uh, talk about some of the things I've gathered. Um, I will talk about most of it. Some of it I will keep close. Um, but one of the most fascinating and I believe it is proof beyond doubt um, what I have observed and one piece collected um, that I would like somebody to somebody out there to challenge this finding. And uh, I don't know how much time we have left, but uh, I would sure like to tell you this. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, The location I will not give away. Um, I don't want anybody going up there. Um, respect for the land. Um, 
and to leave these guys alone because what myself and one of my best friends found um, is going to be featured in an upcoming documentary also um, next year. Uh, we're on the lower end of Lake Roosevelt, uh, the Columbia River here in uh, Washington, um, below the Spokane River where it dumps into the Columbia. And uh, very, very desolate. We're talking hardly anybody lives in this area. People. And uh, one of my lifelong friends who I've known since diapers uh, had an RV and his boat in this little town, this little small community. And I'll, I'll divulge this. Um, called Lincoln, Washington. A um, couple, couple houses, trailer park, RV trailer park, and a boat launch. And he had spent quite a few summers there, out on the his boat, and uh, he kept hearing late at night during the the summers some. Something jumping off the rocks, these rock cliffs. Uh, we're talking, uh, this is the upper, upper part of the Columbia Gorge. So uh, when the lake is full, it's just like these rock walls just come up vertical uh, in, in certain areas. And then they make plateaus. And, um, but he would send, he would spend his summer evening sitting out and uh, enjoying the evening, fishing uh, at night. And he kept hearing animals of some sort jumping off into the water, splash, and then the swimming motion. Um, humans, we swim with our arms, whether we're on our back or our stomach, uh, and kick with our legs. Um, four-legged animals, etc. cetera, um, their legs are submerged and they're, they don't make a lot of noise and their heads above the water. So they're, they're treading water trying to keep their um, body afloat. So there's, there's a, a difference between um, a four-legged animal and a, a human type body swimming, the, the audible sounds. And, uh, when he told me this, I, now I've known him all my life, and I was like, I didn't believe him at first. He wouldn't let it go. He says, man, you know, you need to come down. You need to come down and experience this for yourself. So I finally gave in, and uh, five-hour, six-hour drive to his place in um, middle of summer. 100 degrees out, and uh, excuse me, we get in his boat and we head down river to this spot. And uh, it's kind of a cool little spot. Um, you can get your boat back in behind this uh, like island of granite. Uh, you're kind of in this little cubby hole, um, but there's no place to pull your boat up. Because the, the rock walls just come straight up. So we had to anchor. And then we had to swim in. And uh, then climb up this first set of this first set of rock walls. Kind of shimmy our way up. Um, I left my firearm in the boat. I wasn't going to make it. I wasn't going to chance dropping it or losing it in the water. Um, I'm, come, I'm swimming in with my boots over my head. And uh, get to shore. And we start working our way up. And we get to the first flat plateau of rocks. I mean, above the, the, the vertical rocks, the first plateau. And I just explain it like this. Um, these massive granite boulders, the size 
of uh, school buses, the size of uh, SUVs, uh, even bigger, just piled upon one another from uh, glacial movement over the centuries, et cetera. Um, and they built like these natural rooms that you can, uh, shelters. Um, we walked into this one room. That's how, that's what I'm going to call it. It's a room. It had one giant boulder on one side, one giant boulder, a massive boulder on top. And the back end was closed off by another giant boulder. So there was one way in and one way out. And uh, the first thing I noticed, I smelled, was this powerful, powerful uh, stench of stale urine. And I don't mean that funky, nasty pack rat uh, urine smell. There's a there's a discernible difference between pack rat and uh uh, urea, uh, urine from a human. Um, and it was pretty overwhelming. And on one of the boulders that made up one of the walls as we walked in to the left was neatly arranged pine cones. And they were they were perfectly arra or arranged in lines, and then another stack on top. I think there was two dozen plus. Um, most of them were ponderosa pine cones, these really large ones. Um, there was a few Douglas fir little smaller ones, but these were seasoned pine cones, not green, um, not, not right, not, uh, not usable. And I mean, what I mean by usable is coming up here. Um, inside each pine cone leaf, you can pry it open with your knife or whatever. And there is a nut a pine cone seed. I've always called them seeds, but there's a pine cone nut inside there. And that's, that's an edible food source. And multiple of these pine cones had a six to eight inch length, soft wood, not weak, but a soft wood stick that had been used to pry open these pine cone leaves to obtain the nut. And that is tool use. That's using your hands, your thumb, and a tool to manipulate a food source to get to that piece of material or product that you need for consumption. Now, I, I want to state this, and I mean this in the most <sighs> nice way. Most places that you go around and explore, there's human trash somewhere whether it's a beer can from wherever, cigarette butts, garbage, candy wrap or something. In this area, there was zero sign of human activity. Zero. Um, nothing. So when him and I saw this at the exact same time, we looked at each other and we're like, we're in their living room or kitchen. Um, I, I call it like, uh, their cache, uh, a root cellar, uh, a storage area where they've been gathering up these pine cones and 
organizing them for whenever they're going to need them. Uh, maybe when winter comes, they can come down there and they've got a, a food source so they don't have to go look through the snow for, et cetera. So we were astonished to find this. Um, but that's tool use. And I told my friend Kyle, he won't mind me saying it. He's my one of my best friends. I said, we need to get out of here. We're in their living room. We're in their kitchen. We need to get out of here. Because we were in almost to the back that if one of them or something were to come to the opening, we're trapped. We have no way out. So let's get out and, and back out and leave this alone. And uh, again, the only way I can describe this area is it's like out of Jurassic Park, just these giant granite walls and these little plateaus and uh, like you went back in time, um, just pristine. And uh, instead of going back to his boat, I said to him, let's walk up this game trail about a hundred yards. I'm, I, I'm curious. Let's just go up a little further and, you know, just look around. We took a few steps. Now this happened. I can't explain it, but off to our left, higher up, there was a rock clack, just clack, clack. And seconds later, from the opposite direction, higher up, there was a response of clack, clack, clack. And I took that as a warning that we were being watched and they were communicating through rock clacks. Um, this was not like an animal walking across loose rock. Uh, scree, uh, uh, making that noise of, of that hoofed animals make, or this was clearly clack, clack, and then a response, clack, clack, clack. Kind of nervous, kind of, kind of spooky, but, uh, I think we were right. I said, you know, I says, Hey man, we're, we're, we're in their area. But the curiosity still got the best of me. And I guess we were rewarded, but we worked our way up just about 100 yards. And I had enough. I says, it's getting too steep. It's getting too rugged. Um, let's start working our way back down. So we had come up one game trail, came walked a few feet over and then there was a secondary game trail that kind of wide its way back down um, to where we needed to get to, to the shoreline. So we did, we decided to take this, this other game trail down. I'm in front. Um, in this area, there are, it's very well known for mountain sheep. Um, not mountain goats, but large herds of mountain sheep. And uh, as we're working our way down, I noticed on the forest floor a yellow game tag, an ear tag that had a three-digit number. And I was from the Washington Department of Fish and Game. And, uh, but it had not been torn the, the, the clasp where it connects had not been torn off. Uh, it looked like it had been ripped off the animal's ear. And uh, there was a lot of, not a lot, there was uh, 
a decent amount of blood on one side and I would touch it and it was still pretty tacky, not dry, but sticky, tacky to the touch. So I'm like, huh, this is uh, probably a very, very fresh cougar kill, predator kill. And, uh, but of what? Had no idea. Um, I still think it was from uh, a mountain sheep. Um, so we start working our way down a few more yards. And now we start to find scattered bones, small pieces of vertebrae, uh, broken rib pieces. Um, there was a scapula, um, other assorted small fragments of bone. Um, we didn't smell any decomposition. We didn't smell any rot. We didn't smell uh, any abnormal smells. We didn't hear any of the, the birds that will come in to scavenge any uh, decomposing animals. But these bones were almost void of muscle, sinew, meat, etc. cetera. Um, as if they had been cleaned off somehow, but no tool marks. There was no bite marks, no tool marks, no scrape marks. Um, almost like um, you, you get a, a piece of chicken or, or a rib and you, you just clean it off, but you're not biting into the bone. You're just, you, you get off as much material as you can. Um, there was still some sinew, um, some little pieces of material, meat, um, muscle, fibers. But most of the meat was gone on these pieces that we found on the ground, which I, uh, this is very odd. So we start working our way back down, and I'll never forget this, uh, this tree. It was one of this, one of these ponderosa trees that you could just, you can't even get your arms around the base. It's so large and just looming over everything. It was like, it had been there forever, not forever, but it, it's a very old tree. And I looked at the base of the tree and I noticed that the pine needles and a lot of the floor substrate had been cleaned off and in its place was all of the long bones of this animal the femurs the tibula the fibula uh the upper bones the major long bones And they were stacked like you would stack firewood. And every bone had been broken. And I don't mean like you would snap a pencil or break a stick over your knee. These bones were grasped somehow and it's called a spiral break when you apply so much torque that it spiral breaks it and then splintered open. And most of these bones mimicked the pine cones. They had almost the same length of sticks the same material, soft wood, but hard, stuck down into these long bones deep enough. They were, pr they were prying out the bone marrow to get that nutrition. I mean, that is some of the best nutrition you can get next to the liver and other parts of an animal is the bone marrow. 
But that's, again, tool use and not snapping them. They were twisted and spiral broken. The amount of strength that it takes to do that is, I don't think there's a human on earth that could do that. Now, this stack of bones was only a few yards away from this pine cone cache. So right then at that moment, hearing the rock clacks and the response of the other rock clacks, I think we had stumbled across them collecting their food or whatever, and they had heard us coming and they went up high up and was observing us the whole time. But to find, excuse me, but to find bones that have clear use of tools to obtain that nutrition, that's intelligence. No bear can do that. No bear is able to grasp a stick and manipulate the way we can with our thumbs. I mean, our adipulsable thumbs are here to, for a reason, let alone the sheer power it took to break these massive bones and the manner that they were broken. Now, I didn't take any pictures with me because we were just going up to look around. Um, that was my fault. Um, later, a couple of years later, I found another uh, bone break like that with a stick stuck down the side of it. And that I have a photograph of uh, as evidence. Um, Jason, we're going to have to wrap up the, the interview. Yeah. But can Is there yeah. anything you can tell me that you know that you haven't told anyone else or there's you know any piece of information that would be new and revealing that we can share there is one there's multiple ins uh there's i know you said we got to wrap this up so it would take some time um but i can tell you a story or i, I can tell you uh about a gift incident um that was kind of cool. And I'll make this quick. Um, years ago, I was walking this logging road. Um, and it was late fall. And uh, I had found in the, in the center of the logging road on this little trail, um, a glove one glove uh medium weight uh mid or thin slate glove not for cold weather but um uh, uh i believe it was just a, a hunting glove some guy had dropped or person had dropped when they were walking this at some point in time and uh it was new so I figured maybe the guy will come back uh, and try to look for his glove at some point in time. So what I did was I took a um, aspen tree near the trail. I bent it way down and I put the glove over one of the top branches, stuck the glove over it, and then let the tree go back to its normal position. And if you're walking this little trail, uh, you would see this glove saying hi to you at the top of this this aspen tree um and i left it there left it there all winter and uh next spring my uh family and i we go walk this trail and uh i get to the spot in the trail 
where I had told my family the previous year about this glove. And on the drive up, I mentioned, yeah, this glove. Uh, I wonder if it's still there. And uh, we're just conversation. We get to the spot and uh, I showed him the tree and the glove's gone. Gone. I figured the wind had blew it off the winter. Uh, maybe the, uh, the guy had came back and found it. Um, who knows? Um, but we continued, continued and continued on this trail. We got to, uh, where we wanted to turn around and we started walking back and, uh, it was, I was in the rear. Um, I don't remember who was in the front. Um, one of my kids or my wife. Um, but as we got right back to that spot directly on this foot wide path was that glove. It was not there when we walked past it, but on the way back, it magically was right there in the middle of the path for us to find and see. 